This is the female reproductive system. Um, this is recorded on January 30th, 2023. I appreciate you guys for tuning in for the first portion of the lecture preview. Uh, roughly, we have 74 slides. We'll probably get through around 20 or 30 of these within the first lecture. I'll introduce some important points, some important anatomy to know and to be aware of. Um, we'll also go over some uh, physiology that I, I think will be important, uh, probably for examination purposes, and then we'll we'll finish up with some pathology. So again, this is the basic anatomy, some terms to be familiar with. This is, um, again, if you remember how we introduced the male reproductive lecture, we, we talked about some, uh, we, we tried to break it up into different portions. So again, we're going to do the same thing here. Uh, you're going to have the ovary itself, which is uh, homologous to the male testy. Um, this is going to be the site where hormone production is primarily going to occur through the production of estradiol, progesterone, inhibitor, and relaxins. Uh, you're going to have the uterine or fallopian tubes, which is going to connect the ovary to the uterus itself. Again, the uterus is going to have this uh, endometrial lining, which is going to be shed during menstruation. This is also where um, the fertilized egg is going to develop and begin to mature into the zygote, and then from there um, will form into the baby. Uh, this is the uterus itself. It's got three different layers. You've got the inner layer, which is the endometrium, the mesometrium, which is the um, middle layer, and you've got the myometrium, which is your muscular layer. Uh, the uterus opens up into something called the cervix, which is just the connection between uh, the vaginal canal and the uterus. The cervix is the opening. Um, this is uh, for anybody who's ever had a pap smear. They go in, they take a cervical smear, and they are detecting, trying to detect for see if there's any abnormal cells that could potentially be cancerous. Um, so once you get more external out here and, and uh, you get to the vagina, uh, the vagina being that muscular hollow tube, um, and then outside of the vagina, more superficial is going to be something called the vulva. The vulva is going to be the superficial area. It is going to contain the labia minora and the labia majora, and then the mammary glands, which are not present here. This is another picture here, just kind of depicting. Um, you can see this is going to be a more posterior view. We'll start with our basic anatomy up here. This is the sacrum or your butt bone. <clears throat> um, as you can see here, the sacrum continues down to the tip. This is known as the coccyx. Directly anterior to the sacrum is the rectum. And directly anterior to the rectum is um, going to be a place called the recto-uterine pouch. And that's because you have the uterus, which is anterior to this uh, rectum. And this is a space called the recto uterine pouch right here. Uh, so as you can see here, we've got the uterus, which is anterior to the rectum and superior to the urinary bladder. You'll see a different view of that on a transverse plane here shortly. Um, uh, as you can see here in this picture, we have the fallopian tube right here connecting the uterus to the ovary itself. Um, as you, you can see, the relationship of the uterus to the bladder, um, whenever you have, uh, whenever you're uh, in pregnancy, you can see that a baby here, as the uterus expands, it would obviously cause compression on this bladder and uh, cause an increase in frequency of uh, having to go to the bathroom. Uh, directly anterior is the pubic symphysis. This is the pubic bone. And um, as you can see, the bladder coming out here, you're going to have the urethra. The urethra is going to open up to the external urethral orifice. The external urethra orifice. This is the labia minus, the labia minora. This is part of the vulva once you're on the outer surface here. So let's begin discussing these terms. We, we opened up with these terms, the gonads, the ovaries. Again, we were talking about these different structures. Now let's go into them individually. So the ovaries, again, these are going to be homologous to the testes. Uh, what's important to know is that they're going to be uh, secreting uh, different hormones, such as uh, progesterones, estrogens, inhibins, and relaxants. And so it's a site of hormone production. Again, the ovaries are going to be homologous to the testes. So we know the testes had spermatocytes, and we talked about the um, change of the diploid state from uh, the primary to the secondary. We said that the primary spermatocyte was diploid, and then it went to a haploid state whenever it becomes secondary. So again, this is the same picture. We've got our diploid, uh, 
primary oocyte, and then as it goes through meiosis, it will become that secondary um, oocyte, and this is the haploid state. So the secondary oocyte is going to be in the haploid state, and then it's able to develop into a mature egg after fertilization. And it will become mature because why? It would be able to have that diploid state of chromosomes 23 coming from the spermatocyte, and then 23 coming from the secondary oocyte. These are some important terms. Uh, I, would, I think these are testable. Uh, I would know these. The broad ligament, the ovarian ligament, the suspensory ligament. Broad ligament is going to be paired to the parietal peritoneum. You can see this on the following screen. The ovarian ligament, again, is just going to attach the ovaries to the uterus. And the suspensory ligament is going to suspend the ovaries to the pelvic wall. So here's the round ligament here. This is uh, going to attach to the um, uh, parietal peritoneum. The ovarian ligament is going to attach the ovaries to the uterus itself. And then you've got the uh, suspensory ligament, which is going to suspend the ovary to the pelvic wall. As you can see here, suspensory ligament attaching to this uh, ovary to the pelvic wall. And then you've got the ovarian ligament attaching the ovaries to the uterus itself. Um, also, uh, let's get into the different portions, the different ovarian components. Um, the ovary is going to be covered by this unique epithelium. And you can remember from uh, Biology 137, we talked about epithelium being uh, the cover. Uh, it, was, it was made up uh, of these layers of cells. The ovary has this unique called germinal epithelium. There's no other uh, really surface in our body that has this epithelium. So I think it's important to know that the ovary uh, consists of this germinal epithelium. And again, we have this tunica albuginea. This was the same type of mus muscular layer that covered the testes, so it's no surprise that it's present here within the ovary. And then you have an ovarian cortex. And anytime you see the word cortex, that just means outer surface. Uh, the ovarian cortex is going to contain ovarian follicles and stromal cells. These follicles are going to be um, responsible for the uh, development of these ovarian cells. And you remember follicle stimulating hormone, well that's where that term comes from, FSH. FSH comes down and it's responsible for oogenesis, right? Oogenesis being the formation of the oocyte. And you remember from the uh, male reproductive that FSH was responsible for what? Spermatogenesis, absolutely. So FSH is going to come down here to the ovarian cortex, primarily within the ovarian follicle and cause follicle maturation. And again, you've got a medulla, ovarian medulla, similar to the adrenal medulla, right? You had the adrenal cortex, the outer layer. You have the adrenal medulla. Here you have an ovarian cortex, which is the outer layer, and an ovarian medulla. And with, with inside this medulla, this is going to be where your intervascular supply is going to be primarily located. Again, the ovarian follicles, is, it's important to know that they're in the cortex, and they consist of the eggs or the oocytes in various stages of development. And surrounding cells are going to nourish and help develop these oocytes and secrete estrogens. And we know that eggs, we know that oocytes are going to be responsible for secretion of the estrogens. Um, so as the cells begin to mature, they're going to begin um, uh, developing, getting larger, and begin filled with this fluid and uh, begin to uh, enter into the secondary oocyte. Uh, during ovulation, we know that the secondary oocyte is going to be the ma more mature form of the oocyte, ready to be fertilized. Um, if there is no fertilization, then the follicle will be, then um, enter into something called the corpus luteum, where it will then begin to secrete progesterone. So again, you're going to have the ovarian component. The ovary, the ovary itself is going to be called, covered by something called germinal epithelium. Within the ovary, you've got an ovarian cortex, which is going to be where the follicles are produced. The follicles are going to be responsible for maturing into the secondary oocyte in response to FSH. Um, once you have the secondary oocyte, um, if fertilization happens, that's great. But if it doesn't, the menstruation is going to happen, and um, we form something called the corpus luteum, and progesterone is going to be um, produced. We'll cover that later on in more detail. I'm just kind of giving you guys a brief overview. 
this is a, a histological slide here that is just going to show you um, the germinal epithelium where it's located. The ovarian cortex here being on the outer side again, this is where the mature or this is where follicles are developing in different stages of maturation. Here are the ovarian medulla, it's no surprise that it's in the middle here. And the medulla is going to be an inner layer, again, containing all the vascular and lymphatic supply. You can see the blood vessel here within the hilum or the opening uh, cover, coming in, into this ovarian medulla. And this is a degenerating mature graphene follicle. This uh, is a mature follicle in which it, it did not become fertilized and is then beginning to de degenerate. This is just another picture here showing you the ovarian cortex. Again, it's on the outer surface right here. And you've got these follicles in different stages of maturation. You have the primary follicle here, um, or the primary oocyte here, and it's beginning to develop into the secondary follicle. And then this is the germinal epithelium. Again, just this is the uh, epithelium that covers the ovary. That's important to know. And as you get in here, you've got the ovarian medulla. And there's different um, layers here within the ovarian medulla itself. You can see the blood supply coming into this ovarian medulla. This is just a picture here showing you uh, the location of the ovary and the fallopian tubes. So oogenesis and follicular development. So oogenesis begins before females are born. So that's actually, you're born with all of the eggs that you were going to have. I think that's very cool to know. Uh, males will continue to develop uh, sperm throughout their entire life, but females are born with a set number of eggs. During early fetal development, you have the primor primordial or the primitive germ cells. They migrate from the yolk sac to the ovaries. The germ cells then differentiate into oogonia. This is important to know. So germ cells differentiate into oogonia. They become diploid 2N stem cells, meaning that they have what? 46 chromosomes. That's right, 46 chromosomes. Before birth, most germ cells degenerate. And then uh, a few will develop into primary oocytes. And again, we know that they're still diploid. They're in this 2N stage. They'll begin then to enter into meiosis 1 during fetal development. So each covered... Each are covered by a single layer of flat, flat follicular cells called the primordial follicle. So primordial follicles develop into primary follicles. That's important to know. So again, just going back into this. Germ cells, we have these germ cells that are going to differentiate to oogonia, become diploid to end stem cells. Eventually, um, some of these stem cells are going to degenerate. However, a few are going to develop into primary oocytes that enter into meiosis 1. They're covered by a flat layer of follicular cells called the primordial follicle. We know that the primordial follicles develop into the primary follicle. You can see that depicted on this picture here. You've got the primordial follicle here developing into the primary follicle. So the primary follicle is going to develop into the secondary follicle, right? Uh, backing up, we know that the primary follicle is where the primary oocyte is going to be surrounded by something called granulosa cells. So again, the primary follicle is surrounded by something called granulosa cells. Um, these form a layer called the zona pellucida between the granulosa cells and the primary oocyte. So primary follicles develop into secondary follicles. Uh, theca differentiates into theca interna, secreting estrogens, and theca externa. So the granulosa cells secrete follicular fluid in the antrum. And we'll kind of show you that on this next picture. Here you have a primary oocyte, and again, we said that it was surrounded by follicular cells, and these follicular cells are going to be responsible um, um, for the development of the oocyte itself. Uh, this is another picture showing you a late primary follicle. Again, you have this primary oocyte here. You have these granulosa cells that are surrounding these cells here, and the granulosa cells will respond to FSH and then begin developing into uh, more mature follicles. Uh, the primary follicle develops into the secondary follicle. The theca will be um, responsible for secreting the estrogens, and the granulosa cells will secrete follicular fluid in the antrum. This is another picture just kind of depicting the same thing here, that the primary oocyte is surrounded by these granulosa cells. So the secondary follicle becomes mature graphene follicle. Just before ovulation, there's a diploid primary oocyte that completes meiosis 1. So 
again, the secondary follicle becomes mature just before ovulation. Then you have this diploid primary oocyte completing meiosis one. This produces two unequal sized haploid cells. The first is the polar body discarded in the secondary oocyte. At ovulation, the secondary oocyte is expelled with the first polar body and the corona radiata. If fertilization does not occur, the cell degenerates. Here's a picture kind of depicting that. You've got the ogonia here. Remember, this is going to be your diploid stem cells, right? This is going to then uh, begin to form the primary oocyte. We said, we said that we had formation of two gametes, right? One becoming the secondary oocyte and one forming the first polar body. The text here says that after puberty, primary oocytes complete meiosis one. So it doesn't, the, this is important to know. At puberty, the primary oocytes will complete meiosis one to become that secondary oocyte. It's only at this point that the secondary oocyte can become fertilized and um, produce a um, embryo. Um, so here, after puberty, the primary oocytes complete meiosis one, which produces a secondary oocyte and a first polar body that may or may not divide again. So here you have the production of a secondary oocyte. We're at the age of about uh, 11 to 13, right? 11 to 13 years of age. Uh, the secondary oocyte, the sperm's coming in here. Again, we, we went from um, a two end stage to the end stage right here, right? From diploid to haploid. And um, it's important to know that you produced a secondary oocyte and a first polar body from the primary oocyte. The secondary oocyte, if fertilization occurs, that's great. Then we have an ovum, right? We have a zygote formation. Um, and if not, it will then begin to degenerate. So it says here the secondary oocyte begins meiosis 2. A secondary oocyte and first polar body is ovulated. If fertilization occurs, meiosis II resumes. The oocyte splits into an ovum and a second polar body. So you only get production of a second polar body if you have fertilization. That's important. I'm going to say that again. You only have production of a secondary polar body if fertilization occurs. This here uh, just, again, goes to show you uh, this is the fetal period. Whenever you were in your mother's womb, you have formation of the oogonium. Again, they begin to undergo mitosis and begin to mature. You have the production of a primary oocyte um, through the production of a primordial follicle. Again, this is just that layer of flattened cells. Uh, meiosis is then going to begin uh, where you have the primary oocyte in prophase one. Uh, again, here, once we reach puberty, the primary oocyte is still in prophase one. Um, the primary oocyte becomes the secondary oocyte, um, beginning in metaphase two. And then remember, we're going from that diploid to that haploid state. And then fr from the primary to the secondary oocyte, we had the production of the, our first polar body. And then we know that the second polar body is produced if meiosis two is completed during fertilization. Just a few more slides and we'll conclude the first portion. Uh, these are the uterine tubes or the oviducts, right? They uh, provide a route for sperm to reach the ovum and they're responsible for transport of the secondary oocyte and the fertilized ovum. So two specific functions uh, that I want you to know. One, they provide a route for sperm entry. And if the secondary oocyte becomes fertilized, they provide um, transport for it. Uh, there's anatomy. These are infundibulum. These are finger-like projections, which are responsible for helping movement of the secondary oocyte. The ampulla is the widest portion of the uterine tube. The ampulla is just this area here. Uh, of note, I think it's important to note, is that uh, most ectopic pregnancies occur here. Uh, that's kind of something good to know. Um, so uh, in a lot of examination questions, they will write, they'll say uh, that a woman, they'll describe a woman that had um, uh, she had missed her period, missed her menstrual cycle, uh, positive beta HCG, which means she was pregnant and wanted to know uh, she had bleeding and um, it was found that she most likely had an ectopic pregnancy. Which of the following locations is most likely? And it would be the ampulla of the fallopian tube. That's the most common.
Here's the isthmus of the fallopian tube. This is just the area that joins the uterus. So here you've got the infundibulum. These are the finger-like projections that help sweeping motion, uh, that help allow transport of the secondary oocyte. The ampulla is just the widest portion, and the isthmus connects to the uterus. You're going to have three different layers. This is common all throughout anatomy, the mucosa, the muscularis and the serosa, the serosa is the outer layer, the muscularis, this is your middle layer, which is going to be the muscular layer responsible for contractions, and then you have a mucosal layer, which is going to provide nutrition to the ovum. This is just a picture, again, depicting uh, what we previously described um, in regards to the fallopian tube, the infundibulum, the ampulla, and the isthmus. Here is the layers that I was talking about of the uterine cavity, the endometrium being the innermost layer, uh, the myometrium being the middle layer, and the perimetrium being the outer layer. This is the cervix. This is the opening to the uh, uh, external genitalia, the, the vag vaginal canal. This is their cervical canal here. You've got an internal os, which is the internal portion, which is closest to the uterus, and the external portion, which is closest to the vagina. This is uh, talking to you about an ectopic pregnancy. This is a normal pregnancy where the embryo is actually inside of the uh, uterus. You can think about the um, ovary here and how it transports through the infundibule and the secondary oocyte, the fertilized um, zygote up here into the endometrium. This is an ectopic pregnancy. Again, this is the ampulla. This is where the embryo is present right here. So an ectopic pregnancy occurs when a fertilized egg implants and grows outside the main cavity of the uterus. So again, this is the uterus. This is where the embryo should implant, and this is where the ampulla is. Uh, symptoms, a missed period and other signs of pregnancy, abdominal pain, low on one side, vaginal bleeding, or brown watery discharge, discomfort when peeing or defecating. So this is where we'll leave off, leaving off with the histology of the uterine fallopian tubes. Again, this is just a brief lecture preview. I wanted to come and give you guys um, just an idea of what we will be discussing in lecture. Um, I hope these videos are helping you. I hope they're helping uh, further your studies. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, thank you so much.